This is Guardian Radio, your station for up-to-the-minute news, intelligent, interactive, and engaging conversation. 96.9 FM. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Network. Welcome back to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, your station for fresh news, smart talk all day. It is Tuesday, the 17th of January, 2023, and you are on the clock on this World News Tuesday with Mark Palmer. Good morning, Mr. Palmer. Aaron, how are you doing? I good, thank you. So I, uh, I hope you enjoyed that little sample of that song by Jacob yeah. Miller, my cousin, my Jamaican cousin. Oh. A brother from another mother, right? <laughs> but I want to play that today uh, because Jacob Miller, dear, my dear Jamaican family, I am not claiming Jacob Miller as a Bahamian. But what I'm saying is, is that Jama- uh, Jacob Miller might as well be a Bahamian, right? Because Josiah Kinslock played with the Whalers and would have been playing in that space mm-hmm. with Jacob Miller at the time, that might as well make him a Bahamian. So we can play that song this morning. <laughs> Most importantly, good morning to the officers of the RBPF. Uh, want you guys to stay safe. And uh, want you guys to remember that we are your friends as well. Not just that you are friends, that we are your friends as well. And please, Mr. Officer, cool down your temper, sir. That's all we ask. What happened? It doesn't happen. Oh, okay. I just just check in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just check in. You know. It's mutual, mm-hmm. though. It's balance. Right? We understand the pressures that you're under. We understand what it means to attempt to do a job without the necessary resources or the necessary training or the necessary support. We understand how difficult it is to do some of these jobs outside of a culture, collective culture, that understands the nature of what you do you know, and can understand the problems that come with what you do. So all of that's difficult. At the same time, you know, we say that because we want officers to understand. We practice empathy. We want you to practice empathy too. Please, Mr. Officer. I mean, the hardest thing I find is regulating your own emotions, right? That's, I think that's hard for everyone. And when you get triggered, and I can imagine being a police officer, it's very easy to trigger you. Somebody, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. all they have to do is say one couple words, right? Yeah. And how do you keep your temper, yeah. you know, and not let it spill over into a personal thing? That's that's the hardest thing. I mean, what kind of training do they get? I mean, I'm assuming they must get some kind of training yeah, to help training. them do that. I, I think it's, it's about a question of a priori. You know, like a priori, you guys research that. It's a bit of a complex term, but it's like your, th- it's your framework of thinking. It's like the framework through which you see the world and move mm-hmm. through the world, right? And it becomes, it can become complex or, or, or frustrating, I think, because officers and ordinary citizens often live in different worlds, yeah. navigate the world differently, see the world differently, and sometimes those perspectives clash, especially on this idea of authority and mm. what authority means and how we exercise authority, how we operate in our authority, and what it means to have like lateral authority, right? How do people who have the same level of authority interact with each other? How do you moderate each other's behavior? Mm-hmm. How do you ask each other to cool it down, mm. right? And so I like that song because in that moment, right? In that moment, an officer and, and, and Jacob Miller have the same amount of power. It's only for the officer to recognize it, it right? Mm. And there's, there's a balance there. That's the space we want to get to, where we 
understand our authority, we understand the environment in which it operates, and we understand how authorities don't necessarily diminish other people's mm -hmm. authority. But see, that's why this housing crisis thing is a big deal, right? The problem isn't that young people cannot afford to buy their own homes. It is that young people cannot afford to live in their homes with their parents who insist on infantilizing them for the rest of their life, who insist or refuse to shift their perspective and recognize their children as adults having equal authority to them. And as time wears on, that your, the idea that your children will have more authority than you can manage, right? Yeah, it's like a pull and tug, right? Yeah. Because they, they're moving ahead, right? They're yeah. becoming uh, grown adults, but we still see them as these young kids. I mean, I have the same, I have an 18 year old daughter mm -hmm. and it's the same thing because she's living under our roof. So, um, you know, she has to obey our, our rules. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that age, they're not the most respectful yeah. beings. And my wife finds it hard, you know, but... And just before we start our next segment, yeah. as, as parents get older, their role in society changes. That parent-child dynamic becomes the last space of authority, of recognized mm -hmm. authority they have left. And sometimes people tend to hold on to it. This, this term, we don't bend to our cradle. We don't bend. If you don't, and I tell people this, if you don't bend to your cradle, you're going to fall in your grave. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody wants that. So in the same sense, right? Yeah. We say, please, Mr. Officer, and for all the little children out there, we say, please, Mr. Mummy Daddy, Mrs. Mummy, Mr. Daddy, cool yeah. down your temper, sir. Mm -hmm. It's Don't beat these control. children. Yeah. They just, you know, as a parent, you, you have this control mechanism, right? Yeah. And, but when they grow up, you can't, you know, once Control them 18, in the same way. No, you yeah. can't. You have to try a different approach. All right, listen, I got to get, we got to get mm -hmm. into this segment. Uh, exciting conversation this morning. We have representatives from the Department of Inland Revenue joining us today mm -hmm. uh, to talk about what's going on in the department. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Uh, please introduce yourself to the listening audience. Well, I am Dexter Fernanda. I'm the operation manager here at the Department of Inland Revenue. Oh, thank you. Are you the only person joining us in the Zoom room this morning? There are some other members of our communication team that are here with us, um, okay. but mainly I'll, I'll speak for today as that we lead to about the biggest period of our, of our business, inland revenue section, and that's being the business license renewal period. Absolutely. Great. It's uh, be halfway through January. It's a great time to have that conversation. Tell us what we need to know for 2023. So we've changed a little bit uh, as it relates to the requirements. We still, it's an online process. Individuals are logging. There's no need to come down to the department. So with your wonderful smartphone that has made some of us dumb, you can submit your turnover your supporting documents and then submit a case and we'll review it and then you would have a business license for the year 2023. So we want individuals to know first of all that it needs to be filed on or before January 31st. After that you will incur a late filing penalty and then after March 31st you get a late payment penalty and we also introduced a 5% compound interest penalty that will come in on April 1st. So what we're saying is file your return and then pay. One thing we've added in this year is that all places that have a commercial location or wherever you, your business is located, you need to also submit clear directions to where your place is. Your, your business be on Queens Highway or East Street South, where specifically on East Street South, and then include also the assessment number uh, for the building that you're operating from. Okay, uh, for most business, it is for most businesses. Aren't they required to have uh, a inspection to determine whether they can operate a business in that place? Is well, let's just say there is an inspection. Uh, the 
there are different acts. And so the physical planning act, that uh, the town planning, there is no need or the, the act currently hasn't been amended to say that in your inspection, you are required to submit to the Department of Ministry of Works the assessment number. Okay. What it says now is that they that you need to identify where the place is located. What we're finding is that individuals have are not on our tax book. So there are individuals who are, yes, they are operating from place, but they have never, after gotten their conveyance, their building occupancy, they've never come down to the department to register the property. The second thing is we don't see business licenses where the individual for a commercial location have um, identified where the rent and the accommodations that they're receiving from the commercial is being um, filed to the department. So we're making this a level playing field. We're starting off from scratch. So this year we are re requiring the assessment numbers. As you would see in the physical planning, um, the consolidated agency application now, your assessment number is now required as you submit for the process. So we are just in the process of stepping back, making sure everyone is compliant. That's what I want to find and moving forward with the business license application. Okay, so let's... let's. I, I have a question, Mr. Fernandez. So um, say you're running a business, right? Mm -hmm. And But you haven't yet registered um, your business. Is there, and you're just, you know, because nobody's really chasing you, et cetera, uh, is there like a penalty for non-registering? And how would you know if there's somebody running a business that hasn't registered yet? You know, it could be like a mama, you know, somebody just running a bakery out of their home, that kind of thing. Yes, so the Business License Act and Value Added Tax Act gives us administrative penalties that can reach um, range from $750 a day to $1,500. Wow. If you're fined with uh, operating a business, which we will call, for lack of word, illegal uh, mm -hmm. business without the relevant information or relevant approvals. The next portion of that is that you will also be assessed and the act allows us to go back 10 years. Wow. So for example, let's say that you're in a commercial place and you haven't uh, been forward with bringing the information, that's fine. We'll go back and assess you from the date of your occupancy certificate. When you became a commercial location, and so it's best that you come into us, voluntary, then for us to then raise this assessment on you. So right now we're asking people to come in. Let's be honest with our turnovers. Uh, my, my pet peeve is of certain industries where you can sit down and, and do a, an automatic calculation. For the ladies who, um, let's say nails cost $55, manicure is $55. Mm. You times that by work eight hours a day. No, let's say you work seven hours a day seven customers, one an hour, mm -hmm. you are at a minimum of making 385, if my calculation is right. And for if you're only working five days a week, you already reach 1,900 for that week. You should at least for 52 weeks be a VAT registrant. Let's knock off two weeks mm -hmm. you take for vacation. You're, so we are now getting to the point where we're sitting down and looking at the information. We're asking individuals to be truthful. If you're advertising out there a certain price, we can, you know, do some guesstimation. But we would prefer not to go to that point, raising assessments. And so we're now asking people to be honest as best as possible. And, you know, BAME is a very honest people. Um, so we're asking for individuals to submit their real, their turnover before they de uh, take out any deductions. Not their net profit, but their total revenue. Collected. Right, that's what I was about to ask. This figure of 100000 per year is gross, not net. Mm -hmm. That's right, gross. Right, so it's what you take in. So let's, let's, go, let's go to the, the area. I know I might get in trouble with this. Let's go to the area. But listen. We know that in some um, industry, there, yeah. is a, some, there is a certain people who brag about paying a daily ASU. So at a minimum, if you are doing an ASU that, that throws a hand of $500, you are, you are working hard to at least make $500 a day. What are we saying about the turnover when you submit something saying that you only made $500 for the year? I got you. And, and you I mean, that, you that, understand? that's obvious on the face of it that mm -hmm. the, the numbers don't match up. And then, then you have two individuals employed. So you're either you are lying at national insurance or you're lying to us. So how how is it you know how are you able to sustain 
employees with that at that rate. Right, and to engage in that so type of activity. Individuals. Yeah, um, Ms. Ms. Fernanda, how do the agencies work together? Because I, I would imagine that would be a good way of, you know, cross-referencing, you know, exactly what you just talked about. You know, is there any communication between national insurance, uh, or would this be in an investigation, would this be triggered by an investigation, or is there any, um, you know, are you yes. collaborating so, with most them? of this is triggered by investigation gotcha. or industry studies. Yeah. Um, we would go after um, industries. Let's be honest, during the pandemic, the best thing that sold was liquor. Everyone for their lockdown is so <laughs> to liquor. So yeah. we try to look at the industries, look at industry trends. We're working with memorandums of understanding so that we can share the type of information, um, making sure, you know, legally we can do that type of uh, cross-referencing. But, you know, you could do your own statistical analysis within um, your department. Um, there is a saying, there is a line on the business license that asks you your number of employees. So you, we can guesstimate from there, make sound uh, estimates of what you would look like as an average turnover of your revenue. And that's what we raise the assessments on if they are not willing to come forward with the information. All right. I, I see in a recent article, Inland Revenue to Increase Scrutiny of Business Turnover uh, in the Nassau Guardian, that the, uh, the department is targeting uh, $146 million in business license fees for this fiscal year. And I am excited about helping you all collect that. Uh, first of all, I want to ask about private collection agencies, but i uh, sorry, second of all, I want to ask about private collection agencies. First of all, I want to ask what type of businesses need a business? Because I've been running this Chick Chani business for about two years now, and nobody told me that I needed a, li a business license to sell Chick Chani's. So Chick Chani needs to come in and, and get that business license. The act says if there is any exchange of worth for the transaction. So you who are doing the breeding or there is some type of exchange of, rev of funds for that service, good or service, you need a business license for activities that happen within the jurisdiction. So one thing that also happened this year is we had previously with export services, mm -hmm. the activity happens in the Bahamas, but it's a, mm. a, a, enjoyed outside of the Bahamas. Yeah. That now, that export item, the export of conch, export of et cetera, whatever that export item, that is now a part of your revenues submitted to the department. So back to your question, every taxable service needs a business license. So... Um, the act states now, let's be clear, even if you're a nonprofit organization, let's say you're selling mops, the act waivers you from certain fees, but you should have a business license. So you're exempted as a religious or a charitable organization from the fees. Right. That can change. But you must school, get the license. Mm -hmm. You must have a license. So a school is exempted from business license fees, but it says that you should file. It could be a decision of any government at any point to say, hey, I need to now include you into the tax base. And so everyone who has, uh, there is an exchange of revenue, the exchange of funds should have a business license. And uh, if I'm an NGO, do I need to be registered under the new NPO Act as That's a part? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So you should have your articles, a member of nonprofit registration from the uh, Registrar General. Then you come down to us so that, especially if you're getting a, a, a significant grant from the Bahamas government, you know we now have the tax compliance certificate that says that even though as an NGO, your staff is, your national insurance contributions are happening, we're getting there bit by bit, communicating with each other. At the end of this month, we are also partnering with the National Insurance Board. So if individuals know that they are delinquent or need to make some payment or registration with the Department of National Insurance Board, they will be here at the department from the 24th through the 26th in person. So it will be a one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. um, you can come and make that payment. Even though they are online portals, there are some individuals, a small portion, who still want to come in, who still wants to stand on the line and get a, a, a receipt in their hand. Mm -hmm. So we're going to accommodate those individuals at the end of the month. I like what you, I like what he's, you say about a one-stop shop. I used to be a businessman back in the day. And it's a lot of work, you know, a lot of paperwork. You know, you've got VAT, you've got all kinds of business license, 
accounts and you know it's it's a lot of work you know it's hard enough making a living you know being a businessman and taking those risks and then you know what are what are you guys doing to minimize that whole you know that back end work that a businessman needs to do right yeah. and and so consolidating consolidating it because it's it's you know and and just that you know most stores haven't really got that math training and it's like mm -hmm. you don't want to touch it right because it's it's yeah. oh it's too complicated let me deal with the customers instead would it, would it be reasonable for me to suggest to Bahamians that starting businesses to assist people in com uh, ensuring that they are in compliance with the business license and all of the other tax requirements, is this a good idea and is it needed in uh, general? It's a good idea. Uh, we are always encouraging growth and maybe that's a good area for this uh, special development uh, area. Uh, but what we've tried to do is that any seventh grader can go onto our webpage and follow the steps. We've placed everything on there. Uh, we've gone from step one straight to step five. After you finish step one, we've created helpful YouTube links and, and tutorials mm -hmm. on how to file, how to do these stuff. Everyone is now electronic. So we have a one-stop shop, a consolidated agency application. No longer do you have to go to physical planning environmental health, Ministry of Works for building control, the police for the fire and the liquor license. All you can go to the one web page, submit and follow the steps, complete all the steps, and you can have your license within seven working days. Mm -hmm. This is so, great. What is the so web page? We're moving, mm -hmm. but there's still that populace who wants to say, hey, let me stand on the line. And we understand that oh, it's over time. And, uh, Mm -hmm. things will change so we still try to accommodate both um, both as much as we can absolutely and what is the uh website how do i get there so the website yes. is inlandrevenue.finance.gov mm -hmm. that's for government gov.bs that's inlandrevenue.finance.gov.bs and, and we also have a help desk yeah. that's open. And the hotline number from the family island and, and New Providence is 225-7280. 225-7280. You know, I agree with you. Uh, the online access is mm -hmm. great. And be, I say be patient with the uh, newer users. It takes them practice to mm -hmm. develop the comfort level with the new technology. See, what I've noticed, mm -hmm. um, I mean, with the property, I know the business is a little bit more complex, but be straightforward. And what I've noticed now, you get the emails, you get the, you know, you get an email every year in good time with the, with the um, charges and then the, the payment plan. And so there's no excuse, right? Yeah. You know, like BPL, they send you that. So that, I think that's really improved. And it, it's, you know, then it's down to me if I don't pay. Right. So right. You, you have that's made right. it easier for sure. Absolutely. And I, so, so, go on. We've made it easier. Um, unfortunately, we went through a point of an amnesty period to see if we could get people to come in. They didn't mm -hmm. come in. After the amnesty period, we've made demand notices on banks. Some individuals are still uh, left the jurisdiction. And so now we've actually placed them in third party. So before we get to the point of going to the third party, we wanted individuals to come in. Uh, because once it goes to the third party private collection, there's now 40% added to your bill. 40%? So, uh, wow. 40%, that's the, the, you know, that's added to your bill. So we're, we're encouraging people. And there's like one year. These are institutional, uh, historical information where they have, have significant arrears. Right. And so we've actually, uh, maybe this year, encouraged the use of garnishing where we can um, have your, the rent of your tenant redirected to us to pay your mm -hmm. outstanding taxes. Pause. And so Pause right there. We have these instruments, but we want to. We don't want to enforce them. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to encourage landlords to first make sure that their um, their rares are addressed. Uh, uh, absolutely. So uh, that is interesting. Mm. This is the Real Property Tax Act empowers the Department of Inland Revenue to retrieve uh, taxes. Through garnishing, yeah, right, mm -hmm. uh, That's great. and so that means that you can request that the tenant who is actively paying rent mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. to the landlord direct to the Department of Inland Revenue. That's correct. That's one method. The second method, if I'm correct, is that banks that are holding mortgages or assets or ass- will, as a guarantee for a loan okay, will be directed to divert the funds to the Department of Inland Revenue. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Are there any other methods or measures that the department has available to them through various pieces of legislation to quote unquote retrieve the money? I think the question you're asking, can they sell? The final (laughs) document we would use is that of sale, sale Sale, of property. And um, that's, like I said, we are trying to stimulate growth within the economy. Mm -hmm. We want to use that as a last, last instrument, last option. Mm -hmm. Um, if possible, but if at, at some point where the outstanding amount is almost to the value of the property, then sale is inevitable that we have to go ahead and sale. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. This, is, uh, this is fascinating. So I, I have a, a, a big question. What did, I heard figures of $1 billion of arrears. Is that correct? Because that seems that's, like that's, that's a percentage of our GDP, right? That's, That's correct. Wow. So we are trying to, uh, to look at this mountain, see how best we can handle this mountain. I didn't know you could um, you could owe a thousand million dollars in this little country of ours. That's that's incredible, Mr. Mr. Palmer. <laughs> I, <laughs> let's just look at it. Um, that, that's, you have at some point we developed more parts of teeth to the act. Um, okay. So at some point when a um, an investor came in, we were so happy to have the investment. We didn't make sure that. Uh, bond was issued for certain taxes. Mm. As as we grew, as the country grew over these fifty years, we improved the uh, the the instrument that being the uh, the regulators' documents. Mm. If the jurisdiction, it it almost be like us looking forward or running after someone who who has vanished in. in into the air. Yeah. So yeah. we are, there is this need, and of course. We, beams are very creative. Today we might be um, Chika, Chikchani, tomorrow I could be Chick, and then tomorrow I could be Chick Limited, mm-hmm. which legally is a different structure. And so we have to connect the dots and, and get the funds collected properly. Absolutely. Uh- Wow, I'm still uh, I'm still reeling from that figure because that how, how a billion if, dollars. How if, long do you think that's been amassing the one billion dollars in arrears? I can't I can't speak to it right now if I have I the information you. in front of me. But um, if you had a list, it would be very long. Outstanding, <laughs> and as you can see, we are addressing the um, outstanding arrears. So we have beefed up the compliance mm-hmm. as it relates to that, so that we can address that. Um, that mountain. We are, we are appreciative of the international and the local uh, advisors that have, have assisted with us in, in terms of what we now have of the road roadmap on addressing those arrears. So the first thing was the demand notices. So anything that's under our portfolio of a lending institute, that's not just the commercial banks. Yes. Everyone is going to a credit credit union, etc. And there is an auto that uh, the insurance. Companies, I understand insurance companies are now giving loans, etc. Anything that is under their portfolio, we're asking them to come in, check on that document because you are responsible for the property whilst there is a letter of satisfaction has not been issued. So even after you've paid your loan and if the bank still owns your property, that bank is now still responsible for your, your debt or to ensure that you cover your outstanding taxes. Do you have a figure for... Um how many businesses there are and how many properties there are in the Bahamas? Could it be? I think that would be interesting. I mean, are we talking about businesses, 20,000? So, I can give you a snapshot of yeah. last year. Last year, 48,000 businesses Whoa. registered as new businesses last year. What? Just new businesses. 48,000 people came in. Out of that 48,000, only 10,000 of them registered for business for mm-hmm. value-added tax. So that's almost 38,000 businesses who are telling us that they're under the $100,000 threshold and we need to work on them. So, and so from those numbers, you see the amount of compliance mm-hmm. that we have to do as it relates to those matters mm-hmm. and address those matters. Yeah. How many so, people would you need in your department? To, I mean, it, it's the same in every country. There's, you, you cannot have a million people inspecting. You know, you have to do it on kind of a lottery or, or you know, you... 
I, I think right. You pick them at random, I guess, or if there's flags. I mean, what? How many people do you think you would need for this to run efficiently and make a dent? In we would need an, an IRS. <laughs> this <laughs> such a, right now we have a, a complement of maybe two hundred, where we are doing more of risk analysis mm -hmm. uh, in terms of looking at the peak uh, industries and going as uh, going in that area where we see there is compliance. One thing with VAT, it tells us over time those that compliant that become compliant less compliant areas and so we're using that type of strategy lessons learned from other countries within the region and so we're getting the correct complement of staff necessary so we're looking at some point becoming the bahamas irs uh, so and, and, and i imagine the, the staff that we would need for that and i imagine that the uh the services that you offer and the tax, uh, I guess, portfolio and as mm -hmm. well, right? Because mm -hmm. so we're looking That's at a, a credit bureau and a credit rating agency in the near future. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Absolutely. It, it sounds like it will be self-funding. You know, because if you can generate that additional revenue that's being well, lost, then that would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? Absolutely. That is a great absolutely. candidate for that type of mechanism. Um, I'm not sure if you could discuss that type of issue uh, on air, sir, but that would be a great um, that would be a great model for government agencies, right? Um, and it, it it propels it 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 also helps to create a different type of working culture where people are motivated to generate the revenue that supports their uh, uh, technical existence. Um, well, I encourage uh, read. There was a document that was launched about tax reform. And such conversations were talked about inside that white paper. I think it was tabled in maybe 2014. So there are documents that, are, that talk about or speak about that move to an authority, an agency, a quasi-government, that type of institutional, and um, the transformation of these leakages in, uh, in revenue. So that's a, our starting point is at least we have that white paper that has um, Absolutely. some teeth to it. Do you, uh, where we want to go. Do you have staff that are available to uh, engage civic organizations and businesses mm -hmm. that want to have presentations on tax reform, the tax reforms and the, the overview mentioned in the, what would be that 2014 paper, and uh, then simple sort of how-to tips for uh, uh, everyday spenders? And business owners. Certainly, um, that's correct. Uh, they can contain revenue mm -hmm. or the revenue section of the Ministry of Finance mm -hmm. um, that has the carriage as it relates to uh, tax implications and, and, and enforcement. So they can call the department and we are willing to talk to the NGOs, the organizations, the special groups, the cosmetologists about every grouping, the importance of the role that we play in terms of getting the ultimate goals within an, an economy done. You know, I always say we are very Nassau centric. Until you drop in a hole in Andres, you would see that the, the revenue that we're collecting helps mm -hmm. to get those things that we, we need within all of the family islands that we enjoy here. Um, I know you've ever, never been in Exuma and realize it's in the middle of the day that there's no electricity in the middle of the day where the electricity mm -hmm. is off. We want it to be as that island is growing that we are able to support that infrastructure that is necessary there. Absolutely. Mr. Fernando, I've got a call, and then i got a couple of mm -hmm. texts for you. Let's go to the call. Okay. Uh, good morning, caller. Good morning. How are you? Yes. Um, are there any payment plans? Because I don't hear them saying anything about payment plans. Persons coming in and making payment plans. What, what is with that? Absolutely. Okay. So the first thing, as it relates to payment plans, um, they can come in and talk to us. Once it is under a lending institution, you have to be redirected back to that that bank or financial institution that gave you that um, instrument. You, your discussions are with them. Um, like I said, we have gone through four years, four years of in encouraging people to pay their taxes. We uh, gave an amnesty period, and which we gave 50% off 50% off and waived your um, surcharges. And then and we gave a period of three years. Individuals did not take that on. And so we have reached the point of the demand notices. So if you have a uh, property that is not under a uh, mortgage, a portfolio of a lending institution, mm -hmm. we're still willing to discuss with you. You can call our department 
and we can have um, someone come in and we can talk about a payment plan as it relates to the outstanding taxes. All right. And really if, if, to if, shut no company down. We want the company to, to grow. We need them to grow so we can have employment. Mm -hmm. We want to address the, the regular situations. But at the same time, we need you to be cognizant of your taxes and pay them. Your As you, you have to remember that your VAT that you receive, once you net it off every month or every quarter, make sure you lend that, send the funds that is necessary for the government back to the government. Do not use that funds as part of your cash flow. Right. So what is earmarked for taxes, for VAT, of, or VAT collection, or for taxes, you need to put that aside and ensure that you send it to the relevant agencies when necessary. Mm -hmm. And the and we have, go on. We have a wonderful social media, uh, web page, uh, Facebook and IG, uh, all those places that you can get information. We have helpful tubes up there. What you need to do, um, we're just encouraging the individuals to come in before January thirty first, on or before January thirty first, pay before March thirty first. And you don't want that interest penalty on April 1st. So and the interest penalty is 5% starting on April 5%. 1st. So uh, late payment is 10%, interest is 5%, and then late filing is $100. <laughs> okay, what in, in, in terms of like, say, property tax related matters, right? What if the property, the ownership of the property has been in sort of in dispute, right? Say for six mm -hmm. or seven years, uh, mm -hmm. and it turns out, that the person who actually has title was being frustrated in, 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 in holding that title. Uh, is there some grace or leeway for people who are in those types of situations? Well, in those special situations, we have the instructions of the court. So as it relates now, we remain on what appears on the registered conveyance. Mm -hmm. Now, that may that goes with puts to compose that that means a lot of people have conveyance that have never mm -hmm. been registered. Okay. And so we need you, we go by what is there in the registered conveyance. And then once an uh, administrative court decision has been, then we can settle whatever matter there is. Mm -hmm. But we um, hold solid to what there is on the registered conveyances in those matters until the dispute as a decision. That could even be a divorce settlement. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you, whatever, if it's in, in still in progress, we go by what's on the conveyance. And then after this, uh, the divorce um, court, Supreme Court decision, we can follow those documents. Absolutely. Uh, the text here says, hi, good morning. How can tenants be expected to pay rent to without any contract or arrangement with inland revenue? And so I guess well, so the, the thing is you look at the amendment to the to the act the act now has that ability for us as a part of the garnishing okay. so you are in a building mm -hmm. and we're not going to release the information of your your information to your tenant but we first start off by saying could you ask your landlord to give us a contact if your landlord refuses to come in and make an arrangement with us we then execute that power, which is under the act, and we redirect that rent to the outstanding taxes. And I think it is in section six of both of the Real Property Tax and the Business License Act that has been amended so that we can get those type of garnishing. So the question is, are you comfortable as a tenant um, operating in a business, in a location that has outstanding? I, let's look at it. If you were not paying your bees, mm -hmm. sir, you had a music. If you weren't paying your light or yeah. your water, they cut you off, your phone off. And so we're just going to cut you off, cut you off in a bit. Yes, sir. Smoothly. I get, we got to yes. go to a break. When we get back to the break, and my heart and my wallet just broke just now. When we get back to the break, I think I will have mended them back and we will continue uh, with the text. And uh, with this conversation, I thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please stay tuned. You're on the clock with Aaron Green and Mr. Mark Palmer. We're talking to the Department of Inland Revenue about the changes in the business license uh, process. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. This 
is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. Hi, Mr. Fernanda and uh, staff from the Department of Inland Revenue are joining us this morning for a very important conversation. If you own a business, if you intend on owning a business, if you own property, if you rent property, if you're unsure of what you want to do with your property, you have to tune into this conversation. Uh, it's been fascinating uh, so far. And I've got a ton of text here, and I just want to jump straight into the text, Mr. Palmer, Mr. Fernanda. Oh, I'm sorry, audience members, you're on the clock, and we're having a, a, a timely, a most important discussion about uh, taxation in the New Bahamas. Uh, I got a text here that says, uh, my property is valued under 300000 and real property tax uh, is sending me a bill. Why? That's the question from the text. So the question from me is, what is the minimum threshold for real property tax? Like, what's the uh, lowest property value that attracts a, a taxation? So it's, I think it's 5,000. And that's just maybe a, a vacant lot uh, owned by a foreigner or a family island or something like that. So to answer the question, if it's under 300,000, it does not mean that you automatically exempt. The exemption is for owner occupied. So if the property is under 300,000 and we have proof that you're owner occupied and you reside there, yes, there is no taxes. But we have information when we go to properties, when, the, when we go to properties, the, the tenant tells us, oh, chief, boss man don't live here. So the exemption has been taken away. So, um, unfortunately, we are, are receiving false affirmations by individuals. Mm -hmm. They voted in a different constituency in the election, but yet they're still saying that they live, they, um, they want to occupy for a place that doesn't match. I and so, we are connecting the dots. You cannot do a national insurance verification showing that you live X, mm -hmm. and then you want exemption for owner-occupied at Y. So the first thing is, if we make mistakes, we agree we do make mistakes, come in, do an affirmation form, and then we can um, ascertain exactly why you're getting the, um, you're not getting the exemption. Absolutely. And so the first thing we look at is we have um, an assessor who might have been out to your property and we receive information from your tenant. Or we have information from extra sources, maybe water and sewage, where you've signed on a document to allow your tenant to sign to, to get the electricity on or the water on. Absolutely. So first of all, we want people to be honest. Mm -hmm. You cannot be owner-occupied at three locations. Well, hey, you can have, you if you are wealthy like that, you might have three locations, but only one of them can get the exemption. Absolutely. A text has asked a question. Uh, they said, listen, here's the context. Landlord is occupying the same building as the tenant. They're both operating some sort of business or they have some sort of occupancy. The Department of Inland Revenue begins, oh, so the Department of Inland Revenue can identify the owner of the property. The property owner is in arrears on real property tax. Will the department garnish the rental payments of the tenant even if they can identify the landlord and the landlord in the building? So the, the answer is yes. We will still garnish because if there's an outstanding arrears, yeah. we have the ability to garnish. Absolutely. Is there any contractual agreement between the tenant and the landlord that would somehow supersede the provisions in law in the Real Property Tax Act and the Business License Act? Well, we haven't seen any challenge because once you first come into our department, when you receive a, your your business license, we ask you for your lease agreement. Okay. Uh, at some point, we ask you for your lease agreement. When you went down to physical planning, you're supposed to present your lease agreement. Okay. Um. So that 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 at that time tells us what you were paying. 
Um, of course, you know, inflation, some people have changed okay. their lease agreements or their status. So um, we haven't been challenged as yet. Um, but so we know what you were paying at the time when you first came into the system because you were supposed to produce your lease agreement. I got you. I understand now. I understand now. I, uh, I'm not saying that I run a business. I'm just saying that I have to have <laughs> Let me be right honest. We, we, let's look at the flip side of it. Mm -hmm. Some individuals are now coming into, into us and telling us, listen, I, I rented my place for this person to live in. I didn't know she opened up beauty, beauty mm, parlor. I understand. And I, I do not want her in my place doing that. I don't want my subject tank filled up with perm and I have to pump every two months. And so uh, we're to the point where we're realizing landlords don't know what's going on on their premises. They right. never gave the permission. Ah, I understand. I understand. Okay. Thank you very, very much. I think we're all out of time. Um, I got mm. a caller. Let's go to the caller very quickly. Good morning, caller. Good morning, Aaron. Uh, uh, good morning to uh, the, the representatives for the Inland Revenue Service. Uh, two very quick questions here. Um, firstly, um, for, for properties, persons not occupying the properties, just for clarity, is there is there uh, taxes being imposed that's not being uh, occupied this yet or just being developed? One. And my second question is, uh, from the best of your knowledge, do you know if there is any provision in law uh, uh, that's coming up where uh, uh, there's annual tax returns for all these taxes that people are paying into Inland Revenue Service. Thank you for taking my call, Everett. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. did the hem very clear. So let me try to answer the first question. Mm -hmm. Basically asked if, if the property is undeveloped, is there a tax? Well, the Real Property Tax Act was amended a year or two years ago. Um, that says something about improvement. Previously, we used to wait until the occupancy certificate. So the it's real property tax says that improvement is anything that is aff affixed to the soil. So if you change it from virgin soil and has now placed a structure on it, that structure is called an improvement and has a value and can be assessed. Mm -hmm. with banks, when you get your first phase of your release of your payment in a loan, or let's just be honest, that structure, if it, God forbid, a hurricane comes back, what would you need to do to fix, rest to rebuild that that you had on your property? Mm -hmm. And so it is assessed that that value has, a, that structure has a value. So even a derelict, la, derelict building or a building that's not complete has a value. It not, might not have the same grade as an A, but it has a value. And so the act changed. We used to wait until the occupancy certificate, but we've realized individuals have moved in with partial occupancy certificate, half electricity or whatever they want to call it, mm -hmm. and never come into the building, come into the, the department. And so mm -hmm. we are now going after those type, of, those type of structures. So as you get phase one and phase two of your release of funds from the bank, we then have a value for that which is on. We'll look at other things because, you know, behemoths, we try to do things out of our pocket before we go to the bank for the last lending part of it. Yes. Mr. So that structure is uh, we raise an assessment on the value of what we think it is in, um, to build that. Absolutely. So I hope that answers the first question. Thank you, so Mr. Fernando. We are, we are all out of time. I all out of time. But okay. listen, this is great because it means that I have to beg you to make, if not on the clock, the Guardian 96.9 radio the home of all tax information, right? Let's make this the space where we teach Bahamians about the new Bahamas that we are going to be navigating. This is a fascinating conversation. I've got callers, I've got texts, but I'm so sorry to everyone. We're out of time. And so please visit inlandrevenue.finance.gov.bs for more questions and answers to your questions. And you can call 225 7280. That's 225-7280 for more information or to speak to someone. And I'm going to repeat this information over the next few days until I can convince you gentlemen and the department to come back on again. Let's continue this conversation so I could be in compliance with my Chikchani empire. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Fernando. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Thank you to the callers and the listeners. 
the Texters. Have a great day, Bahamas. Beam color in.